Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to UCSF Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm your host and director of Grand Rounds, Lakshmi Santosh, filling in for our chair, Dr. Bob Wachter, while he's away. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Davis today to talk to us about management of one of the most important reasons for hospitalization, one of the most common causes, and that is heart failure. The field of cardiology is really well known for cleverly named trials that they rapidly synthesize into evidence. And Dr. Davis today is going to highlight the latest evidence in GDMT, Guideline Directed Medical Therapy, and how we can apply the latest data to our patients. This is going to be a really high yield, practical, and exciting talk. A little bit more about Dr. Davis. He is an associate professor and director of the heart failure program in the Division of Cardiology at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. He's a well-established clinician educator who's an award-winning consultant and teacher. He won the 2020 Dr. Chip Chambers Medicine Subspecialist of the Year Award recently. And he's a San Francisco native. He was born and raised in San Francisco, came to medicine, medical school and medicine residency at UCSF, as well as a CHF hospitalist year here. Then he went to fellowship in cardiology as well as advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology at Washington University in St. Louis, took a brief detour as the medical director for mechanical, mechanical circulatory support at OHSU, and we were very lucky to recruit him back to ZSFG in 2018. As a cardiologist, he is an esteemed clinician, educator, and his research really focuses on innovative care systems that reduce admissions for CHF. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jonathan Davis. Thank you for speaking to us. Hi, incredible introduction. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much um, for the kind words of introduction and obviously for the, for the invitation to come speak today. This is a real pleasure and privilege to um, talk with you all about something that's obviously deeply important to me and, and touches all of us. And I think the goal of today is to not just touch about you know, heart failure and its management, but I, I really want to try to make this um, applicable to folks that don't see people in heart failure clinic, uh, maybe not even in cardiology clinic, and um, kind of have some pearls and some takeaways. So even if you're seeing someone in a general medicine clinic or in a different subspecialty clinic, that some of this is, is a hopefully relevant to you as well. So with that, we will get going. So we're going to cover um, just a little bit of the background on the epidemic, uh, on the epidemic of heart failure, and just more and more about how we're seeing an increasing volume of heart failure patients, and those numbers and uh, resources needed to care for them, and the cost of caring for them is only going to continue to increase. Um, probably about 60, 70 percent of our talk is going to be an update on on the most recent guideline statement that came out just about a year ago from the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the Heart Failure Society of America. Uh, it's a 150 page document. I promise we're not going through all of it, but I'm gonna pull out some of the key things that are gonna think will be really generally applicable, um, hopefully to all of us. And the finish in the last 10 or 15 minutes or so with some practical applications, some just I, I can't help myself, but a few clinical pearls and some tidbits about how we actually prescribe and think about using some of the key medications um, what we're not going to be talking about today are some more advanced things, bad in transplant, for example, but also some of the other devices, inv invasive uh, monitors like cardiomems, that the medical therapy and the guidelines and the data to support it are, are profound. And as we'll talk about, just being on these, some of these meds that we'll discuss can have a profound, profound impact on how our patients do, how they feel, and how long they live. And that's really going to be the bulk of today's talk. So with that, we'll, we'll just jump right in. And heart failure is a public health emergency. 64 million people worldwide are living with heart failure. An estimated 6 million Americans over the age of 20 currently have heart failure with about a new million new cases of heart failure annually. And heart failure really is the end stage of most um, many medical conditions, end stage hypertension, end stage diabetes, end stage valvular heart disease, end stage coronary disease. All of these things can lead to a diagnosis of heart failure, obstructive sleep apnea, obesity, thinking about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that really, as we'll talk about, aggressive um, comorbidity management is crucial um, as we think about the large volume of patients dealing with heart failure disease. 46% um, projected increase in Americans from 2020 to 2030 as the population gets older and these comorbidities have more time to mature. And the prognosis, and we'll kind of really want to spend a couple of slides putting this into context, the prognosis and and the comorbidity associated with having a diagnosis of heart failure. That if you get diagnosed with heart failure, there's a 50% chance that you will not be alive in five years. Just think about it. how many diagnoses do we give folks where in five years from now, there's a 50-50 chance that you will have died. 
And some of the therapies we have available can dramatically alter that, nat that natural history of the disease, which otherwise is universally fatal. And the cost, this, this talk is not really focused on cost, but just to point out, it takes a lot of resources and costs a lot of money to care for this patient population. And those costs are only expected to increase by 60% over $20 billion from 2020 to 2030. So anything that we can do to get people on medical therapy, keep them out of the emergency room, out of the hospital and doing well and living longer and having better quality of life is absolutely critical. And heart failure is a progressive disease. Uh, and what I'm showing in this slide is the, in the orange is kind of the overall general clinical trajectory from doing well, compensated at the top, and as you move down, lower and lower, getting worse and worse. And, and the normal progression is you have an event, you go into the hospital, for example, your volume overload, not doing well, and, and we can diurese you, adjust your medications, but more often than not, you're not quite as good as you were when you were admitted to the hospital. And then over the course of time, things get worse and worse. The admissions start stacking up. They get more frequent. They get more significant as people um, pass away. And without medical therapy, that this is a universally progressive and fatal disease. And the treatments we're going to discuss in detail today can really um, dramatically alter this. If not stop it, certainly slow it down, depending on when you're meeting the patient where on along this path. And... To point out that once you have the diagnosis of heart failure, your prognosis is equally as poor. Um, there are many studies and many cohorts that have, that have shown this over the recent years. I like this, um, I, choose, I choose this one because I just like the visual representation of it. The life expectancy in the US overall, um, starting on the left in your average 65 to 69 year old and then moving into older, older age, that your average life expectancy just under 20 years, 15 years, 10-ish years as you get older, but then looking down at the heart failure population, light blue for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and this is uh, the BEF is um, borderline, but mildly reduced ejection fraction in orange, and gray is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And you can see the average expected survival is the same. If you're 65 to 69, your prognosis, your estimated time of survival is you know, about three and a half years, regardless of your EF type. And that is true for the 70, 74 year olds and older that once you have heart failure, your prognosis is not good. So it's very easy to think that your ejection fraction is 20%, you're in deep trouble, but your EF is 65%, you know, in the normal range, oh, you're in the clear. That's actually not true. Once you have heart failure, you're sick and your risk of something bad is very, very high. And to further put this into context, I have on the left the ASCVD risk, um, which we calculate in primary care clinic all the time, thinking about their risk of over the next number of years of having a myocardial infarction or ischemic stroke. And if someone is at a very high risk of having this happen at 7%, oh my goodness, we need to get them on a statin immediately. They're such high risk. And now you compare that to a heart failure patient. And that seven-ish some odd percent doesn't even apply to your most stable heart failure patients. So on the left, you'll see you know, the stable, your stable quote unquote outpatient patient, outpatient individual with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, NYHA class two symptoms, no recent hospitalizations, that lowest quote unquote risk group of heart failure patient is still significantly higher risk of coming to the hospital or dying in the next year than your highest risk ASCVD risk. And we, we think about ASVD all the time. We think about cancer diagnoses all the time. And you get the diagnosis of cancer. Like, oh my goodness, I have cancer. We gotta do this, 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 and that immediately because I have cancer there's not really that same visceral response with most people when they find out they have a diagnosis of heart failure, but the risk is exceedingly, exceedingly high. So I, I wanna move on in terms of what we're gonna do about it. It's a bad disease, there's a lot of it, um, but what are we gonna do to treat these folks? And there are many, many themes. Again, it's, this is a, a long guideline statement that was put out last year, but I wanna walk you through a couple of, of bigger, bigger items. One is we'll touch on the revamp classification. It is a little bit of alphabet soup, so I want to kind of put a little bit of context to it and make it a little bit better understood. SGLT2 inhibitors, sodium glucose co-transport 2 inhibitors, most commonly empagliflozin and dapagliflozin are here, not only here to stay, it seems like every clinical trial that we find out something new that it, it, it cures or treats um, kidney disease, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, MI, et cetera. Um, but really across the ejection fraction spectrum now, um, SGLT2 now have the best data regardless of EF, and we'll talk about that. Uh, I am going to touch on, because this was a, a key inclusion, 
was impact on disparities in vulnerable populations. I'm going to talk on that for just a few minutes, um, kind of about two thirds of the way through the talk, um, because this was the first time that this, um, this area, uh, talking about social determinants of health, talking about different um, populations, different risk populations, really made into the guideline statement and it's being more of a focus now in clinical trial enrollment and how we think about patients with heart failure. I'm going to very, very, very briefly just touch on cardiac amyloidosis just for one slide. Um, it was a change from the old guideline in terms of how it was incorporated. Um, I'm just going to mention it just so you know it's there, but we're not going to spend a great deal of time talking about that. But definitions, heart failure. And we all think it's kind of, you know it when you see it. But as I mentioned, once you have the syndrome of heart failure, your prognosis is equally as poor and you don't need an ejection fraction to diagnose heart failure. It is a syndrome. Symptoms are signs of heart failure caused by structural functional abnormality uh, in the heart that are corroborated by a BNP and objective evidence of congestion. But you have to have dyspnea, you have to have fluid retention, and you have to have something wrong with your heart. It is not an isolated BNP. This comes up quite a bit. Oh, their BNP is high. Do they have heart failure? Well, what is the syndrome that they're presenting with? Or they have diastolic dysfunction on the echo. Well, what is the syndrome they're presenting with? Having a high BNP by itself or diastolic dysfunction by itself on an echo read did not give you the diagnosis of heart failure. It is a clinical syndrome. But there is kind of an alphabet soup, I admit, of, of how we, of the nomenclature for heart failure. Before we jump into the hef refs and hef refs and everything else, that we've moved away from systolic and diastolic heart failure. Those were the terminologies for a long, long time. And actually, billing, if you're ever, at, uh, if you happen to be doing billing in your role as an attending or, or wherever you may be, that uh, oftentimes the billers still want to see the word systolic and diastolic uh, in your in your diagnosis for billing purposes, but. From a heart failure perspective, we're not using those terms because everyone with systolic dysfunction necessarily has diastolic dysfunction and the opposite is also true. But we talk about this in terms of reduced ejection fraction below 40%, mildly reduced 41 to 49% and preserved ejection fraction greater than 50%. As we'll talk about, this mildly reduced this kind of gray area in between the 41 to 49% has been ignored for a long, long time. Most clinical trials in the 80s, 90s, 2000s really focus on EF less than 35 or 40 percent or higher than 45 or 50 percent for the HEF-PEF. And this middle range is only much more recently in the last couple of years, um, first with uh, angiotensin receptor nepralysin inhibitor, ARNI, uh, sucubitral valsartan, and then more recently with the SGLT2 inhibitors to really prioritize um, uh, incorporating these folks into clinical trials. But as we'll also see that the treatment really is almost a dichotomy. If you have an ejection fraction less than 50% or greater than 50%, um, we're treating folks kind of really everyone that's below normal are gonna get the same meds and we'll go through the details for that. But a key point I really wanna drive home on this slide is the last line here is the heart failure with improved ejection fraction. Previously, this was referred to as heart failure with recovered ejection fraction. And say, well, recovered, improves, you know, tomato, tomato, but it actually, it makes a big difference because we are not curing heart failure. This is a chronic, incurable, lifelong disease. We're trying to suppress it with medical therapy. We're trying to put it into remission, but we're not curing it. And by saying heart failure with recovered ejection fraction, that leaves the room for potential implication, like, oh, you've got a recovered EF, we can stop your medications. And so we'll talk about that's just not the case. So by calling it improved ejection fraction, going from below 40%, a 10 point increase to above 40%. Numbers aren't so important for this general audience, but the point is that the EF has come back up, maybe back to normal. We call it improved ejection fraction because as we'll talk, we're gonna wanna stay on medical therapy. We've not cured anything. We've put it into remission. And along those lines, I just wanna highlight that there are four stages. You probably are familiar with this. Stage A, no one is gonna talk about stage A disease because that's every single patient you're ever gonna see with hypertension or diabetes. Stage B, you have some kind of structural abnormality, but you've never had symptoms. 95% of the folks that we're going to see in clinic or in the hospital are stage C, that they have heart failure, they have the syndrome of heart failure, they've had symptoms, and they may be at some stage in terms of how well they're feeling, how their ejection fracture is doing, for example. Um, but this is really 95% of folks. And then there's the advanced heart failure folks that are needing um, uh, advanced therapies with heart transplantation, ventricular assist device, they need to go see uh, your Dr. Klein and the team. But the focus really is on the stage C. And because stage C is 95%, 99% of what we're going to be seeing, they, the guideline committee wanted to flush this out just a little bit. 
And so we're talking about these things in terms of new onset or de novo heart failure, resolution of symptoms. Again, it's not curing it that you have, maybe your EF is still low, but you're feeling great or your EF is improved up to normal and you put this into remission. Um, but this is where thinking about that versus persistent heart failure, that all these folks are technically stage C, but just to apply a little bit more granularity in terms of how we think about these folks. And then obviously stage um, still stage C, but it's getting worse. They're kind of heading towards stage D, they're heading towards end stage, you know, they're on the verge, but still technically stage C. But this doesn't cover um, quite a lot of our patients. But let's just jump into actually the medical management and the guidelines behind these things. So starting off, we're going to talk about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We talk about this mildly reduced ejection fraction, preserved ejection fraction, and preserved ejection fraction. So the EF less than 40% first. This is a lot. I'm going to take you through this. This is the main table, class one GDMT, guideline-directed medical therapy. You're going to see that term a lot, GDMT, guideline-directed medical therapy. And it is quad therapy. To summarize this chart, though, the first three lines about our ACE Harbor Arnie, it is Arnie. Arnie is first line. Starting with the um, Paradise MI trial, excuse me, Paradigm MI, Paradigm HF trial, excuse me, in 2014, and with many subsequent trials since then, not only has Arnie, the angiotensin receptor, neprilysin inhibitor, Sacubitril so valsartan, um, been shown to be better than ACE or ARB. It's shown that we don't need to start with ACE or ARB first, and we should not be starting with ACE or ARB first. And in fact, if someone is on an ACE or an ARB, quote unquote, doing well, they've been on their ACE inhibitor for five years and they feel great, those folks will still do better if you switch them over to Arnie. And it is worth changing things up and you should change things up because folks actually do better the sooner you get them on to Arnie versus an ACE or an ARB. And this is a direct quote from the guideline statement, ACE ARB should only be considered in patients with contraindications, intolerance, and accessibility to RNA. So if it's an insurance issue, if it's a BID medication, because unfortunately RNA is only available twice daily, but unless there's a reason why they can't get it, this is the default. That when you start have someone with heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, there's no role for ACE or ARB unless they cannot get or cannot take um, the RNA instead. And then the other three key medications is quad therapy, our beta blockers, our MRA, and our SGLT2. So our metoprolols and carbetalols, our spironolactones and aplerinone, and our SGLT2, uh, empagliflozin and dapagliflozin. And we'll go through some nuts and bolts of these things. But taken together, the quad therapy is class one. Say, well, gosh, four medications, that's, that's a lot. Like, do we really need all four? The answer is yes, we really need all four because it really, really works. And to get back when we're talking about risk and thinking about um, disease um, and treatments for it, if I love to say, I don't love to say, but I say, you know, if in, in conversation has come up, for example, if someone has cancer and need our chop, you don't do R, you don't do hop, you do our chop because that's what works. And these four medications work. And I'm going to show you some slides that hopefully convince you that the package deal can actually make people do better. So even compared to an active, um, compared, not compared to placebo, the background therapy of ACE or ARB and beta blocker, because unfortunately it turns out in the United States that the MRA prescription rates are very, very, very low. Most people in the United States are getting historically ACE or ARB and a beta blocker. But if you do the quad therapy, ARNI, beta blocker, MRA, SGLT2, in comparison to ACE or ARB, you get a 62% reduction in cardiovascular death or hospitalization risk. You see a 50% reduction in cardiovascular death and a near 50% reduction in all-cause mortality. Those are huge numbers, but to say visually, I'm a very visual person, and I think this figure is incredibly striking, that if you put, a, put someone with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction on quadruple therapy with a contemporary four-drug regimen, and your average 55-year-old versus just an ACE or ARB and, and a beta blocker, you on average can increase their life expectancy by almost six and a half years. Six and a half years, 6.3 years of extra life. And if you look when these curves separate, that is really quickly. Again, this is not compared to placebo. This is an active compared to ACE ARBs and beta blockers. have been around for a long time that patients can do significantly, significantly better. And how, okay, well, I met the person a little bit later. How about a 65-year-old? And they're competing risks of, of passing away as you get older. Almost four and a half years of extra life by starting a, your average 65-year-old on quadruple therapy with this four-drug regimen. These drugs really work. The next question comes up. I'm sorry, one last slide is, well, how long? Uh, you know, 
does it take a long time? No, it doesn't take a long time to start seeing benefits. That clinical benefits are apparent with these medications within a month, a month. So for example, if you're seeing someone in the hospital and their average hospitalization for a heart failure patient is five to seven some odd days of diuresis and what have you, you're, you're a quarter of the way there just by starting this medication in the hospital. And also to put this into context, if we think about a defibrillator, which is part of the mainstay of medical therapy for heart failure for many, many years now, you have to have a one-year prognosis. that if we don't think you're going to live at least one year, we're not going to put a defibrillator in you because you have to have a year for the curves to separate. Not so for 30 days, beta blockers, 25% relative risk, percent relative risk reduction in dying. Arnie, 42% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular hospitalization. Almost 40% is true for MRA. And for SGLT2, um, death, heart failure hospitalization, or worsening heart failure, almost a 60% relative reduction in just 30 days after drug initiation. Nothing comes for free. AE adverse events, medical attributable adverse events and heart failure clinical trials. And I think this, I'm gonna walk you through this slide. This was actually just published a couple of days ago, looking at major heart failure clinical trials over the last 20 plus years. It's ACE, ARBs, spironolactone, and dotensin receptor nephilus inhibitors, NHCL2 inhibitors, and kind of looking at, well, how are, what are the adverse event rates in the treatment group? And what are the adverse event rates in the placebo group? And it turns out, just we're gonna start on the upper left here and kind of work our way down the left column and down the right column, that adverse events are really common in patients with HEFREF, regardless of whether or not you're getting the placebo or the intervention. In fact, a roughly 80% of all patients in GDMT guideline-directed medical therapy in GDMT trials had adverse events, 80% in the whole clinical trial. And that's a, a lot of adverse events just by virtue of having heart failure. And the rates of adverse events are not that much higher with intervention versus placebo. For example, no significant difference for SGLT2 inhibitors, MRAs, or RNA versus placebo, and a little bit higher for ACE inhibitors. Patients randomized to intervention versus placebo have lower rates of severe adverse events. Think about that. Putting you on treatment, less severe adverse events, which is good because we're treating your disease. Now, moving to the right column, we've got some specifics for different medication classes, ACE inhibitors, no difference in the rates of drug discontinuation. A little bit higher dizziness, and obviously there's the cough um, that comes up not infrequently with ACE inhibitors that can be um, alleviated with switching to an angiotensin receptor blocker, um, uh, ARB, um, uh, or an ARNI, um, the angiotensin, re angiotensin receptor nephrolysis inhibitor. Beta blockers, 1.1% less likely to stop the drug, no difference in most adverse events, but a little bit more dizziness. MRA, the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, no difference in drug discontinuation. There is a risk of gynecomastia um, that is alleviated by switching to a plerinone. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about MRA specifically in terms of the nuts and bolts. And finally, SGLT2, no difference in drug and discontinuation. In fact, if you look at some of the original diabetic safety trials, the rates of discontinuation were actually higher in the placebo group. But taken overall, no difference in drug discontinuation, no difference in volume depletion or hypoglycemia. There is, an there is an increased rate in the genital infections, and we'll come back to that. Mildly reduced ejection fraction. Again, not as much data here, which is why we have um, lower levels of recommendation, a 2A and a 2B um, for the major classes. But the big one is SGLT2. Um, this, again, from its clinical trials for empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, really span the full spectrum of ejection fraction more than any other really clinical trials have previous to this. And it was on the back of a trial that I'll show you shortly, the Emperor um, Preserved clinical trial for empagliflozin and dapagliflozin has, has had a parallel trial, um, but mildly reduced SGLT2, decreasing hospital hospitalizations and cardiovascular mortality, and then a 2B for ARNI, ACE, ARB, and MRAs. And the reason that this is really lower, and the highlight here is particularly among the patients with a lower EF, is a lack of data. Um, ARNI does have a clinical trial called Paragon. We're not going to go into that. That did show that the lower the ejection, that was a HEF PEF clinical trial, but the lower EF patients did much better than the higher EF patients. Um, and MRA, the famous TopCat trial, which we're not going to get into, had, had a lot of issues. Um, so it has an asterisk. But, but taken as a whole, then the recommendations and the way we're really thinking about treating these folks is we're lumping everyone together. If your EF is below 50%, SGLT2, ARNI, beta blocker, and MRA. Um, 
Pagan as a whole. And we're doing that all together. So in terms of the thing about oh, the EFS, which kind of the three buckets, it's really two buckets, below normal and above normal. The FDA made this a little bit easier for us to get, Arnie, just uh, about two years ago, February of 2021, that the EF range was raised from less than 40% up to below normal. I spoke with the Novartis folks that asked kind of why did they did this to try to make it easier, um, easier quote unquote for providers to get. Um, but I have had zero patients who have an EF um, below 50% that I've not been able to get this medication for with a prior authorization or just prescribing it outright. Um, but it is approved up to a quote unquote below normal ejection fraction. Moving into HEF-PEF, this is still tough. This is still tough. So the class one recommended medication besides a loop diuretic, for the treatment of HEF-PEF, there are still unfortunately none. It is all about treating the comorbidities. If you're obese, helping them lose weight. If they have atrial fibrillation, get them in sinus rhythm. If they have sleep apnea, get them a sleep study, get them a CPAP mask, get them treated. But being as aggressive as we possibly can to treat the comorbidities is really the mainstay of the treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The biggest news though, in the guidelines that came out last year, excuse me, is the SGLT2 inhibitor, which got a 2A recommendation. And that was based on this trial called Emperor Preserved. The HEF-REF trial was Emperor Reduced. This was Emperor Preserved that came out in October of 2021. The primary outcome was a composite cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. And it met its primary outcome, hazard ratio 0.79. And you see the curves separate almost immediately after starting the medication. Now, it was a composite endpoint of death, cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure that was driven primarily by a reduction in risk of hospitalization. Um, so we actually still don't have a medication that can really drive a reduction in mortality with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, and we have so many clinical trials and so much data in heart failure reduced EF space that when this, our first real positive clinical trial, Arnie got close with Paragon, but didn't quite make it. Beta blockers, ACE, R, uh, uh, PD-5 inhibitors, nitrates, all have been studied in HEF-PEF, and this has been the most successful clinical trial. And as we'll talk about, the effects are consistent in patients with or without diabetes. SGLT2 inhibitors are not diabetes medications anymore. Yes, they were developed as diabetes medications, but these are really cardiovascular medications. They are renal medications that also have some diabetic effects. Um, but we should not be thinking about these as diabetes medications. We have to be thinking about this family medicine as a heart medicine or also as a kidney medication as well. Also making this a little bit easier for us to get um, through prior authorizations and through insurance is last year, uh, the FDA approved just over a year ago, empagliflozin uh, for heart failure with any ejection fraction. So we sh there should be no barriers. It's in the guideline. It's FDA approved. It's not off label to use SGLT2 inhibitor across the EF spectrum. And just a summary of these recommendations: a two-way recommendation for SGLT2 inhibitor, to be uh, for mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, especially on patients with lower ejection fraction. And same thing for Arnie, particularly among patients on EF of the lower end of the spectrum. So as you get up into normal range EF and certain to higher, high normal and above normal EFs the data are less strong to support the use of these medications. And plus with the ARNI, if you get above normal ejection fraction, the FDA has not approved it for that. So it's certainly gonna be more difficult to get. Um, but this is the mainstay of medical treatment for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So my clinical practice is I get everyone on an SGLT2 inhibitor. I do my best to get everyone on an MRA. Usually it's spironolactone. And then if I can, an angiotensin receptor blocker, an ARB such as Losartan. Uh, I have not had success getting ARNI for patients above a 50% ejection fraction based on an FDA um, uh, decision. And finally, improved ejection fraction. So improved EF, again, those folks who start off with a low EF and now it's improved up into um, a mildly reduced, if not normal range, don't stop the medications. And I have to say this again, don't stop the medications. We are not putting, we are not curing this disease. This is a chronic, we're trying to suppress it. We're trying to put it into remission. We are not curing the heart failure. So that ejection fraction, 65%, the person feels like a million bucks. They're doing awesome. Great, stay on the medicines. As a level one recommendation, we'll talk about some of the evidence on the next slide. This is based on a small clinical trial, but lots of cohort data um, over the years and, and the cohort data is really several thousand people. The 
And one of the RCTs is pretty small, but I'm going to show you it just because it's so striking. Even if you're asymptomatic, don't stop the medication. This was just one small trial um, called TREDHF that came out uh, four years ago. This was small. Again, it was only 51 people. So yes, you have a whole class one level one recommendation, but there are more data, more data to support this. But just as one example, what can happen if you have someone who's quote unquote doing great, their EF's up to normal, they're feeling awesome, they have no symptoms, no edema, they're doing great. These folks were randomized to stay on their medical therapy or to stop. And the event rate was almost 50% in the, tr in the control group where you're weaning off therapy excuse me, the treatment withdrawal group. So if you see the orange lines, again, the numbers are on the smaller side, but the point is extended through other trials. But you see that the people that had their treatment withdrawn, their event rate just goes straight up and up and up and up. And by six months, almost half the patients who had stopped their medications had the return of their heart failure symptoms, if not a reduction in their ejection fraction. So it doesn't take that long for the wheels to fall off. So just because things are looking good, you have to keep going with the medical therapy. And that's something that we have to know as the folks providing it, but also is incredibly important as we educate patients when they first get this diagnosis that look, it's a lot of medications, but they work and they're lifelong. That whenever I see someone that the echo comes, the echocardiogram comes back and the EF is back up to normal, the first thing I say is awesome. Second thing is we're not gonna stop. And just to, you have to have that mindset from the onset with patients as you're doing education that even if things go great, which we hope they will, and hopefully they do, um, but we have to stick, stick with medical therapy. I'm gonna spend just a few minutes talking about this because it has such an important um, implications. A, that it was included in the guidelines and is finally, finally getting more traction amongst the major societies and clinical trial um, designed, um, thinking about these other populations. In fact, the word disparities in the last guideline statement um, that was initially in 2013, had some small updates in 2016, 2017. The word disparities occurred twice in those, that ent those entire documents. And now it has several whole sections with value statements um, to help draw much needed attention um, to other populations. And there's definitely a need for increased awareness. We have to, have to, have to be aware of biological factors, social determinants of health, and implicit biases that impact the burden of the disease, decision-making, patient experience, patient perception of their disease, patient um, where they are in terms of how they can engage um, and effective delivery of guideline-directed medical therapy. We are very good in the hospital and clinic of prescribing. You know, in the hospital, we prescribe the right medications. Oh, they're leaving the hospital on this, this, and that. But what happens when they get discharged and they get in the car and go home and they get in the ambulance and go to rehab, wherever they may go, what happens next? They, the clinic visit ends, they have their after visit summary and they leave. Do the pills get in their hand? Do the pills get in their mouth? Do the other lifestyle things that you talk about, what actually happens after they leave that clinic visit? Um, we have to be more explicit with how we think about these things. And for the first time, the guideline statement really dives into that as well. And for example, the highest incident heart failure is consistently observed in self-identified black patients. What are, what are we doing in terms of systematically, in terms of our clinic and in terms of our um, our resources addressing this population, and others that are higher risk of having something bad happen. And there are a lot of barriers to care engagement. And we're not going to get through all of these, but as we think about our clinic structure, we think about our discharge planning, we think about what we have um, in our heart failure clinic or our primary care clinic or whatever clinic we may be serving, because these are not limited to cardiology issues. This is for any, any specialty or anything that you're doing with um, patient care. Their medical barriers, cognitive impairment, depression, substance use, their social barriers from financial, food insecurity, housing insecurity, how well um, can they read the instructions, what language you're giving them the instructions in the health literacy level um, in terms of how you're doing it. So all these things that we really have to think about, for example, um, without going too long on this path, but you know, at San Francisco General, one thing that we started was a combined um, for patients with stimulant use disorder and heart failure, we started a joint co-management clinic with addiction medicine and heart failure cardiology to try to tackle some of these multiple barriers in the same place at the same time, which has been very effective. So thinking about a multidisciplinary approach to addressing these barriers and reducing them uh, as much as possible. And finally, the, the different populations do experience heart failure differently. And again, this is true for other non-cardiovascular issues as well women, older adults, lower socioeconomic status populations, and then his, um, black, Hispanic, et cetera, populations have their different, um, different risk profiles and things that have to be um, considered. And I, I urge you, if this is an area of interest, to go take a look at the, um, 
at the guideline statement itself. And it really goes through nicely with each of these populations that showed what data are available, how they've been studied. Uh, unfortunately, many clinical trials for heart failure and other things as well are, are primarily um, Caucasian white men, Caucasian men. So oftentimes these populations are not as well included in clinical trials. So what data do exist um, as far as risk and as far as targeted interventions? As I mentioned before, I, I just didn't want to throw this out there just so you've heard of this. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about amyloid heart disease, but it did have some new recommendations in the guideline statement um, that we, Amanda Aris does have a, you know, an am, a cardiac amyloid clinic and is actively engaged in clinical trials and in contemporary management. I just do want to mention very briefly that um, tefamidus, um, which is a, a transthyretin tetramer stabilization therapy, stabilizer therapy did receive a class one recommendation um, for a TTR cardiac amyloid. Uh, and then also patients with cardiac amyloid and atrial fibrillation that anticoagulation is reasonable regardless of your CHAD score. Um, there are some updates in terms of screening patients for um, cardiac amyloid, thinking about what symptoms a patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction increased wall thickness may have. Um, a little bit beyond the scope of the talk today, but there were some um, novel recommendations in terms of diagnosing and, um, and treating these folks uh, that did not exist in the guidelines before. So I'm, I am gonna leave it at that with cardiac amyloid. I know it is very brief, um, but it was a key thing that did change in the statements. I just wanted to mention that. But I am gonna spend um, the last 10 or 15 minutes and leave time for questions. I, um, but I wanna talk about some practical considerations for prescribing GDMT guideline-directed medical therapy that if you do not have to be, you should not have to be a heart failure cardiologist or a heart failure practitioner in a heart failure clinic to do some of these things. And as we'll talk about all of these medications, even if you're in a primary care clinic, you're familiar with all of them. Everyone is prescribed a beta blocker. Everyone is prescribed spironolactone. That these are familiar medications. It's just because we're wearing a heart failure hat when we prescribe them shouldn't dissuade us. And let's say, well, gosh, I'm in a different specialty clinic. I'm not primary care, I'm not cardiology. You can still, you see someone in your clinic and there's a GI thing, infectious disease thing, and you say, oh, they have heart failure and they're on, they're on any medications. Say, hey, FYI, primary care. Hey, FYI, your cardiologist. I saw this patient with heart failure. They're not on, I don't see a lot of these meds that I've heard about. What do you think? Even something like that can have a profound impact on bringing that recognition that's necessary to get folks on these medications. But for anyone that isn't a primary care clinic, isn't a cardiology clinic, or isn't any other clinic in the hospital, what have you, that is going to be thinking about prescribing these medicines, this is really for you to try to demystify things and give you just some key pearls to actually help you prescribe these. Because I think the guidelines are important, but we have to actually do it. As we've talked about, it's a bad disease, and we don't actually put people on these medications. We're not going to see any of the benefits that I've outlined already. So we're going to talk about beta blockers, the ARNIs, SGLT2, and spironolactone, the four key classes. And beta blockers, um, carvedilol, metoprolol succinate, not tartrate, metoprolol succinate, the once a day long acting version, and bisoprolol have the key clinical data to support their use in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And if someone is on a different beta blocker, they're on metoprolol tartrate, atenolol, labetalol, switch them. It doesn't matter. They've been on atenolol for 10 years and are doing great. Doesn't matter. Switch them over. Their chances of doing better for longer are higher on one of these medications. Um, even metoprolol tartrate, please don't use that for patients with a reduced ejection fraction. There was one clinical trial versus carvedilol called Comet, which one could argue was rigged against uh, metoprolol tartrate, but that's a separate issue. Metoprolol tartrate really is meant to be in the hospital, used four times a day. But if you have someone with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, you're going to be putting them on a beta blocker, one of these three, metoprolol, succinate, carvedilol, or bisoprolol. And the dose is really important. This is our old data from 1996, but it still holds true. Carvedilol is still carvedilol. And the higher the dose you got, the more benefit you tended to get. And the same is true for the other beta blockers as well. So some is better than none, more is better than less. So if you're saying, oh, I'm, I got someone in clinic or in the hospital, I'm only gonna increase one thing today, make it the beta blocker, that we really wanna push the dose. That being said, you do have to sit on your hands just a little bit. You know, you're blocking the, um, uh, um, the beta receptor, you know, the adrenaline receptor in the heart that 
if you go up too much too fast, you could make people feel a little, eh, a little worn out, like they're going up a down escalator. So in the outpatient setting, we're really doing this every two weeks to give people a chance to get used to the dose and then go up. But we don't need to be waiting months. We should not be waiting months, but every two weeks you can make a dose change. And starting when they're at or near euvolemia. So if someone's in clinic or comes to the hospital, super volume overloaded, not the time to start it or increase the dose, but keep it going. Remember, unless the beta blocker is the reason the person's doing poorly, whether in cardiogenic shock or they're really bradycardic, they're, if they've been on the same beta blocker dose for a long, long time, it's not the beta blocker's fault. They're coming in volume overloaded. Look for other reasons. So when they come to the hospital, we're not decreasing the dose empirically. We're not switching the tartrate. If they've been on Carvedilol 25 for six months, stay on the Carvedilol 25. Or the same thing, if they've been on Toprolol 100 milligrams for the last year and they're coming in normotensive with a normal heart rate, it's not the metoprolol's fault. Stay on the same dose and hopefully like up before they go home. But really we're trying to get the heart rate down to the 50s to 60s. That is the goal. We want the resting heart rate nice and low. ARNIs, the angiotensin receptor nebulizing inhibitors, the second newest class. So Cubitrol Valsartan is only one option currently for this. I want to walk you through, especially where Secubitrol fits into this. And I'm going to walk you through this diagram. I, it's, it may look dizzying. I promise you've seen it all before. I'm going to go through it step by step. But I think one of the biggest things in knowing how to take care of a person and start a person on this medication is knowing how it actually works and what it can do in terms of predicting what may happen, but also so we can navigate any kind of potential adverse events um, and keep people on these medications. So briefly, cardiac injury or overload, we get sympathetic nervous system, SNS, and RAS activation, the retinal angiotensin aldosterone system. These two things rev up. So fight or flight. The brain says, where's all my blood? There must be a problem. Let's fight or flight and let's activate this system. And we are very familiar with this. We have been modifying this with our beta blockers, our ACEs, our ARBs, our MRAs for decades now, trying to get less vasoconstriction, less sodium retention, less fibrosis, by blocking this pathway. But also you can see that we're not doing anything to the myocyte. So again, thinking about, you know, what are we doing and why if the one's heart gets better, do we not stop medications? As I explained to patients, we're putting a little cocoon around the heart to prevent it from getting more injured from this extra abnormal signaling that the brain is sending out because it thinks there's a problem. That there is a problem, but it's not a, um, it's not a volume problem, it's a pump problem. And so by blocking the beta blockers or ACE ARBs or protecting the heart from this extra abnormal signal. But, okay, so we've been using ACEs, we've been using ARBs. Where does Secubitril fit into this? So LCZ696, that's what Secubitril Valsartan was called back in, um, in, in Paradigm in 2014 before it got its official name of Secubitril Valsartan. So LCZ696 is an ARB, but it's also Secubitril. And Secubitril is an inhibitor of an inhibitor. And we're focusing on this pathway on the right, the neuropeptase system, now, ANP and BNP, intronetic peptide and brain atropetic peptide. And neprilysin inhibits this pathway, but we want more of it. So Secubitril is a double negative, inhibits an inhibitor, so we get more of this. So more AMP, BNP, leading to more cyclic GMP, leading to more prostaglandin G, and more naturesis, vasodilation, and less fibrosis. But Secubitril can be a diuretic. It can make people lose salt. It can make people diurese. It can also vasodilate. It's incredibly effective for lowering blood pressure, but it can also make people pee. And we have to be mindful of that when we start this medication because there are so many, so many times when someone will start on this and they get a little lightheaded, a little dizzy, or a little pre-renal, like, oh my goodness, they're not tolerating the RNA. It's like, no, they're just a little pre-renal. So let's Take away the diuretic or give them some fluid back. And sure enough, that can make things better. But if we don't know how Secubitril works, we can't anticipate what could be an issue. And we might wind up stopping this medication in a person who might otherwise tolerate it and derive significant benefit from it. So just on one slide, a whole bunch of pearls just to throw out there. You have to have a washout from ACE inhibitors to not from ARB, so 36 hours. So if you're on lisinopril, 36 hours from your last dose to your first Secubitril Valsar 10 dose. Easy in the hospital, not so easy in clinic. In the hospital, obviously every medication is time stamped. But in the clinic, what I'll do is I'll say, all right, today is your last lisinopril dose. You're gonna to skip tomorrow and you're gonna start Entresto the next day. It may be that's closer to 48 hours, but we ensure we get that 36 hour washout. 
There's multiple dosing. The milligrams are a little wonky, 24, 26, 49, 51, 97, 103. They actually add up to 50, 100, 200, um, everywhere else except the United States. But outpatient, you're going up on the dose every two to four weeks in the hospital because of how the inpatient um, HEFREF trial was set up for, called Pioneer. If you want to read it, you get to make one dose increase at 48 hours. But again, the key in using this medication is the natriuretic effects of Secubitril, which are variable. Some people diurese a lot, some people not at all. But if you develop some hypotension, some orthostatic hypotension, especially a new acute kidney injury, AKI, step one, decrease the loop diuretic. Step two, stop the loop diuretic. Step three, increase fluid intake. And step four is to do number three again. This is the only time I've ever actually brought a bottle of water to a patient in heart failure clinic it was because they're having such a robust natriuretic effect to Secubitril. But if they're volume down, they come in with some diarrhea, or they come in because they haven't been eating for a couple of days, that, that, could get, that could exacerbate this. So please keep that in mind as you're putting people on this medication, that if, that if they're like euvolemic, hypovolemic, get rid of the diuretic. If you're in the hospital and they're getting twice daily Bumex or Lasix for the diuresis, hold that evening dose if you're starting the Entresto at night because some folks can actually diurese quite a bit just with this medication. ASHA2 inhibitors, some nuts and bolts on these. Depagliflozin or EMPA, either one, they're both 10 milligrams. We can talk about, if you'd like offline, about some of the subtle differences between their various clinical trials, but the take home is either one. It really comes down to which one you're gonna be able to get with the patient's insurance. Um, and you don't need to switch from one to the other. Whichever one you get that's gonna be cheaper, go with it. And it does not matter if you have diabetes or not. This is just as effective in patients without diabetes as with diabetes. So it is not a prerequisite, not a prerequisite to have diabetes. Um, this is a medication that is developed as a diabetes medicine, but turned out to have a lot of other benefits, even in, and especially in non-diabetic patients. But it is type two diabetes. You cannot use this in type one diabetes given the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. Your GFR can be really low down to 20 in the clinical trials, you can still start these medications. So very low renal function is still safe to start and should be started. The most common adverse events, if you're gonna have it, are really the volume depletion, but really in the hyperglycemic patient. We're not, we didn't really talk about the mechanism of SGLT2, but it blocks a sodium glucose receptor in the kidney that makes you pee out more sugar, the higher your blood sugar level is. So if you're very hyperglycemic, you have more glucose urea. If you're euglycemic, you really shouldn't have any glucose urea. And this is why people thought it was going to be a great diabetes medication because you shouldn't have much hypoglycemia and you don't. But if you're a non-diabetic uh, individual, your volume diuresis effects of this are very, very, very small. And it's really the diabetic folks with higher blood sugars that are going to be more likely to get um, um, dehydrated, get a diuretic effect from this. The key thing though is the genital mycotic infections are several percentage points higher in treatment than in placebo, especially in women and uncircumcised men. A lot of that does come down to hygiene, but not bacterial infections. If you look at all of the diabetic safety trials, the cardiovascular focused trials, the heart failure trials, the rates of your general bacterial um, UTIs are no different. It's the mycotic ones that are higher. So, so oh, someone had two E. coli you know, UTIs in the last year, don't do EMPA. That's actually not the case. And interestingly, in folks that get the mycotic infection, up to 80% of folks will never have one ever again, interestingly enough. Um, but it is, if they do get it, fluconazole, 150 milligrams by mouth times one, uh, will take care of it. And again, we touched on this a little bit, but it does not take long to see benefit. Depagliflozin met its primary outcome in 28 days and EMPA in 34 days. So right around a month, we're seeing a statistically significant decrease in the primary outcome in their clinical trials. So it does not take long to start seeing benefit from these medications. And they're not going to affect blood pressure. I show a little bit extra for this. Um, and many folks are, are not using these as much in your own clinical practice. But on the left is from diabetic patients. On the right is in non-diabetic patients. This is from DAPA-HF. This was the 2019 landmark um, HEF-REF, heart failure reduced DF clinical trial. Though this trend has been reproduced in the heart failure with preserved DF population as well, that these medicines do not lower patients' blood pressure. If you look on the y-axis, arterial mean change in systolic blood pressure, we're looking at a couple millimeters of mercury, and it's not significant. Diabetic, non-diabetic, irrespective of ejection fraction. And this medication is going to be okay with people with lower blood pressure and should not lower your blood pressure. 
but it will impact the GFR transiently. As you're very familiar, if you start someone on an ACE inhibitor or an ARP, you'll see a little bit of a bump in creatinine dip in GFR that gets better over time. And the same thing, this is from MPAGLOFOSIN's um, FREF clinical trial. You can see that at about four weeks, there is a dip, a nadir in the GFR that comes back up. But if you look over the spanning time, the years of the clinical trial, the rate of reduction, the rate of re, um, renal function worsening, it's blunted. Um, and it's renal protective in the long run to be on estrogen inhibitor um, in this population. And finally, don't forget spironolactone. This is the least prescribed of the heart failure medication in the United States. Um, some reports up to uh, two thirds of eligible patients are not getting this medication, um, but it has profound benefits. On the left, this figure is from RAILS, R-A-L-E-S, the landmark clinical trial from 1999 that put this on the map. 11% absolute re reduction risk in death, not relative risk, 11% absolute risk of death, 30% relative risk, huge reduction in mortality. And you see the curve separate just within a couple of months. You do not need to be on other background medical therapy. So you do not need to wait till they're on maximum beta blocker or, or RNA or what have you. You can just get them on it. This will not impact their blood pressure, just like SGLT2. If you think back, to, if you're actively working in primary care, think back to your primary care days, how often are you putting spironolactone on folks with hypertension for their first line, second line, third line medication? These are not active. This is not, this is, I, I have a different slide that I'm happy to show you offline or after, uh, after we're done, but uh, spironolactone is not going to lower your blood pressure in a heart failure patient. You can start at 12 and a half or 25 milligrams. You really only need to get to 25 milligrams to see the mortality benefit. The clinical trial was set up to go up to 50 milligrams, but the average dose in the trial was 26, meaning pretty much everyone in the trial was on 25 milligrams. You do need to follow the potassium. You have to follow the potassium. Um, in the clinical trial, they checked quite a few basic metabolic panels, BMPs, three days a week, monthly, to follow that um, potassium level. Now, this is going to be in clinic. We're not necessarily doing this as frequently, so I usually split the difference depending on their baseline renal function and where they're starting off at in terms of potassium. But at least at San Francisco General Hospital, a K of 5.1 is still normal. That the, without spending too much time on this, but it's very important that the K, a low K, 5.1, 5.2, 5.3 is okay. You have to be able to check it. You have to keep, a, keep an eye on it. But at 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, the patient's gonna be okay and stay on a medication that has an 11% absolute risk in making them die less. Um, if someone, the most common thing I see is they've been on spironolactone for weeks or for months, they've had many potassium levels checked and it's always been normal. Now, all of a sudden it's high, low fives, high fives, what have you. Now, if it's in the sixes, sure, you obviously have to stop it and figure out what's going on. But in the low five, all of a sudden, why? Spironolactone, if it's gonna make the potassium go up, shouldn't do it all of a sudden randomly months or years into treatment. Um, look for other um, offending agents before you just stop the spironolactone. And lastly, the gynecomastia, um, 10 to 20%, depending um, percent of men. The first sign that a man starts having any breast tenderness issue at all, I just switch it over. The longer they have gynecomastia, the longer it takes to go away after getting off spironolactone and onto a player note. So with that, I'll leave us with uh, about five, 10 minutes for questions. This is my last slide. Um, we talk about contemporary you know, advances in 2023, that the biggest thing are these medications. May not be the sexiest thing, not a device or some you know, new cutting edge uh, um, intervention, but it really, really, really works and can tremendously reduce patients' chances of dying, coming back to the hospital, improve quality of life, reduce risk of sudden cardiac death, all sorts of benefits. And to remember as quote unquote, stable heart failure person, is not low risk. Remember the stablest heart failure patient still has over 10% chance of dying or coming to the hospital that year. Now we have to be aggressive, whether it's us providing the medications or saying, hey, FYI, you know, provider so-and-so, your patient has heart failure, they're not on these things. That we have to get people on these medications. We can't be afraid of clinical inertia. We have to know they're important. We have to educate patients at the time of diagnosis. Hey, this is a lifelong disease. Let's talk about your understanding of the disease. Let's talk about the medications. We're gonna be adjusting doses. We're gonna be following these things, but we can make you feel better. We can make you live longer, but we're gonna to have to do it together. And making sure you think about the barriers, the risks, the social determinant issues that may impact that and how you can start making headway on those things early before it's too late. So yes, there are always risks of attempting to escalate, um, but I hopefully I've shown you that those risks are small, 
but the potential risk of not doing things, um, the risk is even greater. Uh, so with that, I will stop. Um, and thank you again so much um, for having me today. And uh, I'm happy to take, uh, take any questions. Thank you so much. That was such an outstanding talk. You are just an esteemed educator and you really broke down and demystified how to start GDMT in a very practical way and reviewing the evidence. We have a bunch of questions from the about 90 viewers logging in. So one of the questions is really about with all these changes in therapy with GDMT, do you think that this might impact thresholds for actually needing ICD, CRT with the improvement in medical therapy? And kind of the, the reverse of that question is, if we've gotten so much better at managing heart failure, why is that five-year mortality still so sticky? And why haven't we made progress in sort of treating underlying causes and curing it? Two great questions. I actually um, wrote an editorial on this with a, a few colleagues about a year or so ago in terms of the ICD question that most of the ICD, I'll try to be brief with this, most of those clinical trials were done before contemporary GDMT. And if you look just in the ARNI clinical trials and the rates of sudden cardiac death in those trials, and you look in the SW2 um, heart failure trials and rates of sudden cardiac death, the rates are significantly reduced just by being on ARNI or just by being on SGLT2, independent of defibrillator, independent of everything else, um, that there has been a large call about you know, re revisiting that these indications that uh, how much time should someone be on quad therapy before you reassess their ejection fraction? You know, how, how much do we say, well, maybe the criteria should change? That's definitely not an area of much discussion um, but GDMT, it works. You need to give it time to work. Um, and depending on which meta-analysis or trial you look at, that some patients, you know, if you have an EF that's low enough to qualify for defibrillator, if you come back six or 12 months later, the vast majority of people don't need it anymore because their EF has come back up and they no longer qualify. Um, but you have to be aggressive with medical therapy. And this gets us into this, trying to answer the second question is why haven't this changed? G, and this is why this is so important in 2023 to still talk about is the rates of actually prescribing these medications are, are, are appallingly low. Um, that people just aren't being put on these meds. Uh, I took out the slide, I, it's in the talk, it's hidden. Um, there was a registry called CHAMP that looked at 150 primary care and cardiology clinics around the country and just looked at prescription rates for patients that were eligible but not prescribed. And the rates of non utilization um, were. Uh, high in beta blockers, high in R, and just atrocious in, in MRA, for example, that we're just not prescribing these. Um, I think we would see a major change um, if we can A, be as aggressive as possible upfront with risk factor modification to get hypertension the most modifiable risk. But as soon as that person walks into your office, your emergency room with heart failure, you get them on all the meds. Um, we didn't talk about a trial that's called, if you wanna look up called Strong HF that just got published at AHA, American Heart Association a few months ago that randomized people to getting on meds like right now, like in the hospital right after discharge versus just kind of taking your time, standard care. People did much better if we did it fast. Um, so to answer your question, we just don't do it very well. And that's why we're here today to talk about it. So you all can go and prescribe GDMT. That's exactly right. A couple of questions about, you know, barriers to doing it. People are asking about what do you do in that patient with hypotension or marginal blood pressure? Or what do you do in people who are really frail, have multimorbidities, advanced age? How do you kind of sequentially approach that patient who has that marginal blood pressure? And how aggressive do you go, especially in the inpatient setting? Well, there's a lot to unpack there. I'll try to hit on a couple of things. Um, so in terms of blood pressure, again, your, your MRA, your spernal lactone, your SOD2, should be able to get away without much of any impact on blood pressure. And there's plenty of data in, from clinical trials to support that. Um, really thinking about the volume status, especially if you have someone that you're switching over to ARNI and they start having more hypotension, really being aggressive and not just peeling back the, the loop diuretic and stopping the diuretic, but allowing them to drink more fluid. Um, I'd say the vast, vast majority of my patients that I'm starting on, you know, blood pressures in the 90s or low 100s, starting on the, um, on the ARNI, if I can modify the fluid enough, I can get the person on it. Um, yes, there are going to be people that are too sick, but the vast majority of people, if you if you really are aggressive with having with hydrating them with the ARNI, can get them on medical therapy. The beta blockers, you know, metoprolol succinate has you know, especially low doses has pretty negligible blood pressure effects. Um, 
you know, tolerating a 12 and a half of metoprolol succinate, a half of a 25 milligram tab is actually lower than your equivalent lowest metoprolol tartrate dose that you can give in terms of safety. Um, I dose it at night. Um, if I have people that are really marginal hyper blood pressure are really, you know, that I need to get on medical therapy because their EF is super low, I'll even dose succinate twice daily, just divide it in half. That can be more gentle. Again, that's in the more of a select patient population that's more sick to start off with. Um, but I could certainly go on things. But the one thing about the elderly or maybe moving towards end of life, that's a little bit different. But yes, elder individuals are not included as much in clinical trials. Most of these heart failure clinical trials are white men in their 60s. That's a separate issue that the guidelines, again, with the disparity issue needs to be addressed. That being said, if you look at the time to benefit, um, for quality, for, forget longevity, if you have an elderly individual, just the quality of life aspects that these medications can improve, take weeks to see benefit. Like SGLD2, in a couple of weeks, the risk of coming to the hospital goes down. So even in folks that are older, you don't have to wait a year to see benefit like a defibrillator. You can see benefit in weeks. So it is still certainly worth giving it a shot and trying these medications. Um, but I can, there's a lot in that question to unpack, but that's just some highlight um, things off the top of my head. Two last quick questions. You know, what is the future of the poly pill or the quad pill, putting these all together? And can you speak a little bit about other innovations that your clinical practice has made? You touched on the, you know, the meth use heart failure clinic and other programs like that. And also, do you have a quick take on the use of um, other diuretics like acetazolamide? That trial was featured at Society of Hospital Medicine National meeting this year and wondering what your take is as a cardiologist. Oh my, yeah, so lots of things. So the poly pill, actually Colette the Young, one of the uh, cardiology fellows is, is gonna be working on doing a project with a few other folks around the country are doing this. Um, but her, her project is really exciting how to actually take all these pills and put it in one little capsule, a little bigger capsule, but how do you, can, can you put meds in one capsule without having to worry about you know, going to some manufacturer pharmacy you know, place somewhere and actually make these powders from scratch. But if you, the pills are small enough, can you physically put them in a capsule that's a little bit bigger, but take them all at once. And and uh, Colette's actually, um, as a plug to her, whoever's listening for her grant submissions, if you're on this, you'll approve it. Um, but that could be a real game changer. I use a lot of bubble packs. Uh, Daniel's Pharmacy, Scripside Pharmacy, Alta Pharmacy in San Francisco do the service for free. They deliver to their door for free. Um, so it's a no cost to the patient. I, I joke, I single-handedly keep these pharmacies in business because I do so many bubble packs because it is a lot of polypharmacy. Um, Cost, thinking about patient access, thinking about working with your pharmacy colleagues, working with social work um, and case management partners in terms of the cost of these medications, because um, some of them can be quite expensive depending on what your insurance is. But if you work with your clinical pharmacist or reach out to a clinical pharmacist, um, we had a great talk at our last uh, inpatient, uh, excuse me, cardiology CME course in December, where two of our pharmacists gave a talk about the myriad of resources that do exist to try to get these patients at a more, get these medications at a more effective cost. So work with your pharmacy colleagues on this. Um, acetazolamide, <laughs> that's a lot to unpack. You can look at the length of stay for the hospitalization, seven versus nine days. I mean, folks were in the hospital a long time. Their doses of Lasix were not that aggressive. Um, I don't think I'm going to yet change my clinical practice. I would have, I think that trial would have won me over if the comparator had included a thiazide diuretic, um, you know, a metolazone, a chlorothiazide, diuril, um, and kind of seeing those two things head to head because we know they make you, they make you pee, they're highly effective, um, but to know in terms of a safety profile and the length of stay profile, we just don't have the head to head data. The only real head to head on even those medications. It's like a 60 person clinical trial that was really small from a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not, I'll, I'll stop there because that the, the uh, ADVOR trial is a lot to unpack, um, but I don't think it's necessarily a straight cut that we should be doing everything. Every patient should just get it off the top. Well, thank you so much. This is a whirlwind tour. Really appreciate you. We'll see you back here next week for Medicine Grand Rounds. Thanks again.